Hello everyone and welcome back. Let's take a little bit of time in this short lecture to look at the role of media in the political process. Most citizens do not interact with government firsthand. They're not in Sacramento observing how the legislature operates. Um, they're very seldom in city council chambers or board of supervisors meetings. So generally the way that we learn about what's happening in government is what we read in the news or watch on television. And the opinions that we develop about the role of government and the people that operate in government tend to come through that filter of the media as well. Over the history of the United States, changes in the media and the people's access to it have really been technologically driven. So if you look at, for example, the invention of the telegraph created the ability to transmit information over a long distance. It ended up developing this idea of neutrality in the media because uh, news services like the United Press Syndicate wanted to be able to sell their news to the maximum number of newspapers so that they didn't want it to be biased. Once radio comes along you have a, an ability for politicians to connect much more directly with citizens. For example uh, Franklin Roosevelt's fireside chats where he spoke to, directly to citizens using the media of the radio. Television changed everything to to making the news much more visual and much less sort of content based. So we see in television uh, um, emphasis on what has uh, good pictures and and newspapers had to sort of follow along with that, have in switching to having color photographs, having many more col photographs on news pages than rather actually having just text there. And of course, the internet has changed everything. News is now decentralized. You don't have three networks that pre present national news every night and generally take the same approach to things. You have the ability to select what your news sources are going to be. and on on the net it runs the full gamut from far right to far left. That's great in that you can find the information that you want quite easily and you don't have to use that filter of the mainstream media press but it also has some downsides to it as we'll see. So let's look at where the media fits in in this policy making process. So last time we looked at the role of interest groups and we saw that they're really involved throughout the policy making process. To a large degree the media oversees that process but really only has a direct role in some aspects. They can help identify the problem. Now usually that's happening from uh, people uh, who as we've said who are experts in the field or perhaps grassroots organization but it's the media's reporting on that that sets the agenda that gets that issue in front of the policymakers. The media is also going to be involved in over evaluating the effectiveness of policies and reporting on whether or not laws or regulations are working or not working. As I said that there's a danger that's associated with the information age because these days it's quite possible to only access information which reinforces our pre-existing beliefs. And this is one of the things that explains why there's such a wide divergence in definitions of problems or in definitions of reality within the political system in the United States. Uh, when people encounter information that challenges their pre-existing views, that generally makes them feel uncomfortable and they'll try to sort of shift things so that they don't have to deal with that. The psychological term for that is cognitive dissonance. It's also possible these days to cite lots and lots of evidence that is not necessarily accurate. Um, you can, uh, you know, for example, write a paper and quote numerous internet sources that are absolutely unbased in fact. But the idea is that people can gather the information that confirms what they believed before. The response to people who challenge them when they point out that perhaps what they believe is not actually true, uh, that thousands of Muslims did not celebrate uh, the crashing of the uh, Twin Towers after 9-11, 
or that uh, well or that President Obama is secretly uh, not a US citizen and has fooled everyone into thinking that he is the response is to just dismiss those people as being ill-informed because after all you've looked at all of this information which bolstered that. It's important that anyone who wants to understand politics and political issues needs to know that they need to consider a variety of sources and need to evaluate their sources in terms of their reliability and their accuracy. Another aspect that we see happen in the media probably a lot more at the national level than we do at the state level in California uh, is the role of pundits in what is called the punditocracy. Pundits are highly paid journalists who get together on television and chat about issues. Part of the reason that we see this rise of the role of pundits is because we've moved into a 24 hour news cycle. The news used to be a half hour program on the, on the television every night at 6 p.m. with sun, some Sunday morning talk shows. Now it's 24-7. In order to fill up that time, they have to get people that come in and talk about issues rather than actually directly reporting on it. And so the these pundits are taken quite seriously. They really do set the agenda. They the, What they focus on on the Sunday shows or on these evening news programs is what becomes important and it has to be focused on. They don't really have that much more information. Um, they really are not a particularly good source for understanding complex issues, but yet in our current system they ha are given inordinate influence in deciding what's important and deciding what the narrative to certain stories should be. So if we look now at the roles of the media, um, they're really varied and, and it's important to note that we're not just talking about the news media because popular media can shape our opinions about politics as well. It's part of that process that we call political socialization. If popular media, television programs and movies portray people in government as corrupt, as venial, um, as cowardly, it's not surprising that over time people come to see people serving in government that way. Um, so and entertainment is going to be an important aspect of this. And even if you're talking about news programs, they want to get people watching. They want to get people reading. So they've got to be in to some degree entertaining in order to keep people doing that. Now, a journalist would say that the most important role is reporting the news. Um, and, and that's true. That's generally how, again, as I said at first, we're going to understand what's happening in government based on the media reports that come out about it. Any news coverage can really take three different forms. Informing, that's the just the facts aspects of it, who, what, when, where, and how. Analyzing or interpreting is kind of looking at those facts and telling you what it means. Analyzing and interpreting news analysis is going to involve historical comparisons. It's going to involve predictions about what they think is going to happen in the future based on past experience. Um, and so they're essentially telling you what the news means. Influencing is different. Influencing tries to get the public to view a story in a certain way. Now back in the olden days, before cable news and the internet, this was generally confined to a certain section of the newspaper that was called the editorial page. Um, and there was a clear distinction between reporting on the news and trying to influence people's behavior. That wall of separation has really pretty much eroded and it's very difficult to separate these days um, what what parts of a story are actually factual, what parts are analysis, and there's an awful lot of influencing that goes on. And, and a lot of that depends on the news source, and our job is to find news sources that at least minimize that editorializing or clearly identify it when it's happening. The media provides a political forum. People in government have to use the media to their advantage to get the coverage that will help them succeed, not only in running for office, but getting support for policies that they're trying to get through. Now, if you talk to the accounting department of any media outlet, they would tell you that the most important role is making profits. With a very few exceptions, 
National Public Radio public broadcasting system, the BBC in uh, in the UK, which is government funded, and C-SPAN in which is funded by the cable networks. Media outlets are in a businesses, and they've got to make profits by selling advertising, or they're not going to survive. And the only way that they can s sell advertising is if they can demonstrate that they have viewers or readers. And so they're they've got to target their news towards a group of people that are going to then be watching or reading so that they can then sell time to advertisers to keep that particular media outlet operating. In terms of the policy making process, however, the most important role for the media is setting the agenda. What the media covers becomes what's important, and what's important is what the media covers. And if something is a front page news story that's being talked about, people in government can't really ignore that. They've got to address that in some fashion. They may try to sort of stall and see if that issue disappears, but they've got to address it. One last role, as I referred to before, is called political socialization. The media is a strong socializing agent, both for its news and for its entertainment. Over the past couple decades, we've seen a lot of concentration in the United States due to the process of mergers and buyouts. This has particularly affected newspapers. Newspapers now are primarily read online. There's very few people uh, that, you know, the print circulation has really decreased. Another thing that has really harmed newspapers is that they used to make a lot of money through classified ads. And now those classified ads are replaced by something like Craigslist, uh, where people can bypass the newspapers. That's cut into their revenue, it's made them lose advertisers, and you see many newspapers, even major newspapers, that have had to shut down because they simply cannot make a profit. In the cases of newspapers that have survived, many of them have been bought up by large newspaper chains that have a similar approach to things. We also see that with radio stations and television stations and such, so that there's been a real concentration in the media. The question always arises about the media is whether or not it's biased. But because everybody's biased, the media is no different. Uh, it just depends on which particular website, newspaper, television program, radio program you're listening to. The diversity that's out there in the United States makes sure that every view from the wackiest one on the right to the wackiest one on the left is out there. Uh, however, the mainstream media tends to present mainstream views because if they view veer too far away from that to either side, they could alienate viewers and readers. In this particular age of cable news, though, we have a situation where you have people who only watch Fox News and people who only watch MSNBC, uh, and, and so that they, you have that, you know, my news aspect that's operating within this. Reporters tend to be liberal, but publishers tend to be more conservative, so there's a, a bit of a balance within there. There is no doubt that the entertainment media popular television shows and movies and that has a liberal bias. News coverage, however, tends to have a conservative bias. And so there's a little bit of a balance between that. Because making money is most important to the media's survival, they're going to be biased towards what's going to increase ratings and readership. So the answer to the question is yes, every media source is biased to some degree. Politicians can campaign against the liberal or mainstream media or lamestream media, as Sarah Palin used to call it, um, as that can resonate with supporters. And so attacking the media has become a popular tactic of people who are running for office. However, if you turn too strongly against the media, it can backfire because it can lead to negative coverage and the media looking for negative stories about that particular candidate. Another way that 
candidates court the media is through a process that's called leaking. So people in government or people in campaigns will give information to a reporter with the promise not to be identified. And reporters tend to cooperate with politicians because they want to be the, the person who gets leaked to. They want to be the person that has the scoop, the inside story as to what's going on within the campaign. So the, there is this little bit of insider outsider dance that goes on between people that are reporting on what's happening in government and politicians and both sides are aware of it they're so much aware of it that there's actually um, an area outside of political dates that's debates that's called the spin room where reporters will go in to talk to representatives of the campaign who will also all tell you what a great job their candidate did and reporters dutifully record these things uh, it's one of the things that leads to reporters being somewhat cynical uh, because they realize that they are kind of playing this game with the people who are in government. The media narrative is a sort of a short endlessly repeated simple interpretation that comes to be accepted because everybody's saying it. Reporters are not supposed to really challenge that narrative or deviate from it. Now the media narrative is something that we see in the mainstream media that we see on the national networks and the way that they report these stories. These media narratives can also often tip into sort of mythic elements in culture. For example, having someone who had a very troubled um, period as a young adult who was able to turn their life around and then become the politician that's really accomplishing great things. Um, or, you know, someone who was not seen as very strong but in a time of crisis rises to, to meet that crisis and becomes a great leader. It can also be incorrect. But because it's endlessly repeated, it becomes conventional wisdom. Uh, now, as I'm recording this in November of uh, 2016, there's an interesting media phenomenon going on right now where presidential candidate Donald Trump is claiming that there were thousands of Muslims in New Jersey who were on rooftops celebrating the fall of the Twin Towers. Uh, there is no evidence that that happened. Uh, but there are lots of people who absolutely believe this because it has been repeated on websites um, and you've got a major candidate who said it on television and we when people have pointed out to him that this didn't happen he said I have hundreds of people who have told me that this happened so we have a very strange situation that's going on now where our ability to actually call people for saying things that are demonstrably not true seems to have weakened and reality is whatever people decide they want it to be. Now Arnold Schwarzenegger was a champion of what's called the photo op, the photo opportunity. Of course Schwarzenegger came um, from uh, the film industry where he was known not so much for his fantastic acting ability but his ability to self-market himself and self-market the characters um, that he created during his movie career. He took that same approach to the governorship and had multiple photo ops and, and really was always um, addressing things in such a way that there were cameras there where things were sort of set up uh, to communicate a certain message. Uh, this is a famous photo op uh, in, that took place in Sacramento. The governor was trying to stress the need to repair infrastructure. So they went into a residential neighborhood in Sacramento and they tore up the street um, and they had an asphalt truck there ready to put down new asphalt and the governor arrived in his limousine and the press was already set up with all the cameras and so the governor went out there and spread a little asphalt and then said a, a few short words to the media got back in his limousine and left and the crew repaired the hole that they'd made in the street and disappeared um, but this is again is, is a typical way that we see photo ops being used and they this has been very prominent in national politics as well. It's an, uh, something that all presidents do to some degree. 
Um, now, Jerry Brown is not much of a photo op guy, uh, but there are occasional ones, and this is a good example. Uh, last spring, they were measuring the snowpack in the Sierras, and as you can see from this picture, the snowpack was zero. And the governor was using this particular um, measurement up in the mountains away from Sacramento to make the case that the state needed to conserve water. So that's another good example of using the media to communicate an important issue that's coming from the governor. The California media market um, is, is one that's pretty challenging to candidates. California is a much more expensive state to run for political office in than say Nevada or Colorado or Nebraska or Iowa. It's a large state and so it's got a couple different media markets. A lot of states really only have one major media market, the large metropolis within that state and all of the uh, reporting comes from that. But in California, we've got Sacramento and San Francisco and the Los Angeles markets. And particularly, Los Angeles market is really a saturated news market. And if you want to buy campaign ads there, you're going to be paying a lot of money for it. Just so that you'll know, um, if you want to learn more about state politics, you're not really going to find it very much on television. Uh, the best source for that is going to be uh, per two particular papers, the Sacramento Bee and the Los Angeles Times. They have reporters that are really assigned to look at California state government. And that's something that uh, the, the television stations are not going to have. It's something that the smaller newspapers are not going to have. So they really are the ones that sort of specialize in looking at what's happening in state government. Lastly, a little bit about the challenge for reporters in covering state and local politics. We know a fair amount about what's going on in Washington, D.C. We know the personalities involved. And when people watch, when people, even people who are news junkies, tend to be really focused on what's happening at the at the national level. There's not a lot of focus on what's happening at the state level. And this is really unfortunate because policy making really starts at the state level. And very often what happens at the state level then goes on to happen at the at the national level. At the local level, news tend to be focused on human interest or crime stories. Uh, the mantra of local news is, if it bleeds, it leads. Uh, local news reporting tends to be an entry level position where reporters are very, very poorly pay paid. They don't tend to stay in that job very long. If they can move up um, to a uh, state coverage or something like that, that's their, they're going to approach that. The state news coverage, again, is most of the time overshadowed by national news coverage. And so uh, there's not a lot of attention that's paid to that. The coverage of state government tends to be really print based. So if you want to understand issues in detail about California politics, you're probably going to have to go to those newspaper um, websites because uh, the r television stations um, and the internet sources, there are some state political blogs, but those are going to be quite biased. So really, the Sacramento Bee and the Los Angeles Times are the go-to places for looking that. So we've talked about interest groups. We've talked about the media. Our next step is to look at political parties before we look at campaigns and elections.